Well, I'm telling you, I'm excited about our teaching on prayer secrets of great intercessors or the secrets of great intercessors. And we've been discussing about angels of God and how angels link themselves with those who are involved with intercessory prayer. Now we're talking about the ministry of Jesus and how angels were connected so deep in his ministry and so deep in his life. Let's take some examples from the New Testament. In Luke chapter 135, an angel appeared to Mary, the angel Gabriel is who it was, and said, you're going to conceive a son, his name will be Jesus, and he's going to be the son of God. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, it was an angel of God that appeared to Mary's husband Joseph and told him to take Mary as his wife. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 9, an angel appeared before the shepherds and announcing that Christ had been born in Bethlehem. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13, an angel appeared to Joseph to take Mary and Jesus down to Egypt for a season to protect the infant from the Roman soldiers who were going to slay the infants of Bethlehem that were under two years of age. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 19, an angel appeared to Joseph in Egypt and told him to return back to the promised land. In Matthew 4, 11, an angel or angels appeared strengthening Christ during his 40 days of temptation. Luke 22 and verse 43, an angel strengthened him during his intercession in Gethsemane. And in each case, the angel brought something, a message from God, because angels are messengers of the Lord. So we look at other examples in the New Testament. Another one is Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through 4, how angels are involved with people's personal life spiritually. Cornelius was a centurion, and the Bible gives us this beautiful story in Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have come up before God as a memorial or as a memorial before God. They have ascended, in other words, and God is seeing them. Acts 10, 1 through 4. Now let's look at Cornelius' spiritual condition. The book of Acts tells us, and of course Luke was the writer of the book of Acts here, that Cornelius was devout, it means he was dedicated and he had a fear of God and he also gave alms. That's the King James word that we would say today, charity or assisting the poor. And it, say, and it also said this, and this is the part you've got to watch. He prayed always. Now, if he's praying always and he's devout, at the ninth hour of the day, they're having prayer at the temple and he would have prayed then. And at the third hour of the afternoon, I'm sorry, at three o'clock in the afternoon, he would have also prayed again. So in other words, he had a morning prayer and he had an evening prayer because this were the two prayer times recognized at the temple that was in Jerusalem. So during prayer time is when he saw a vision of an angel. It also indicates that his prayers and giving were mixed together. So God recognized not only his prayer to honor and answer his prayer, but God recognized his giving and realized that being a giver, that he was a man that was following the principles that God had established in his covenant. And in the scripture here in Acts 10, it says that your prayer and giving have come up before God as a memorial. Now, how does your prayer and giving come up? Well, there are books in heaven that note and keep a record of prayers, that's in golden vials, and giving. There's, there's giving books in heaven. There's a book of remembrance. There's a book of tears. There's a Lamb's book of life. There's a book of works. All these records are in heaven. So when it comes up before God, it means that God looks at the giving record and giving being tithes and offering. And God looks at the prayer record. And how does he do that? Because the prayers come out of those golden vials. That's in the book of Revelation. Come up before God, Revelation 5, 8. And then when it comes together, then God is answering his prayer. So his prayer was that he wanted a closer walk with God. Let's look at that for a moment. Number one, here's what the angel knew when he came. Now watch this. When he came to visit Cornelius, you keep reading. And the angel had information on him. Number one, he knew that Cornelius had been praying and giving. It's the angel that says your prayer and giving. 
Second thing that the angel knew was he knew that Cornelius was sent to, um, he knew that he was sent to Cornelius to answer his request. In other words, his request was, I've got to be closer to God. I want more of God. So the angel knew, here's a request. He wants more of God. I'm going to show him how to get it. The third thing that the angel knew was he knew that Cornelius needed a spiritual connection. So in this case, the angel connected the Italian centurion, a Gentile, with a Jew by the name of Simon Peter. And that was the link or the connection that was made. Now, my point is that this angel in Acts 10 was armed with information and it was heavenly information and he came to earth knowing his assignment. So the angel was a messenger, or as I would say, a connector between heaven and earth. Now, let's look at something in the book of Revelations. Angels that get on prayer assignments. Here's what the book of Revelation 5 verse 8 says. When he had taken the book, this is Jesus the Lamb, the four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now notice this, there are 24 elders in the book of Revelation called the apocalypse. That's the Greek word for the unveiling of a mystery or something that's hid. Now, is it possible that there's 24 hours in a day? Yes, that's possible. But let me say it this way. Since there's 24 hours in a day, is it possible that these 24 vials each cover one particular hour during the 24 hour day? And if you're praying at a certain time, it goes in this vial. At a certain time, it goes in that vial. I just think that's an interesting thought. There is no scripture to prove that, but I thought about that one day that perhaps that's possible, the 24 hours versus uh, connected with the 24 elders. Now, these are in golden vials, which gold represents deity. They're coming into the very throne room in the presence of God. And the scripture identifies them as having odors, uh, which represents incense. Because in Psalms 141.2, it says, may, your, may my prayer come up before you as incense. So in the temple, and the, this goes all the way back to the tabernacle of Moses and the temple of Solomon, and also the temple in the time of Christ, the golden altar was the place that they would take incense uh, and they would uh, take the incense and they would take hot coals off of the brass altar, which was in the outer court, and they would put the hot coals in this bowl and put the incense on and the smoke would go up. So it, it actually filled the holy place with this beautiful, beautiful fragrance. We will resume this teaching after a short message from International School of the Word. This teaching is one lesson taken from a full course on isow.org. If you are enjoying this video, we invite you to check out the full course in the links below. For the best value, try our All Access Pass. At just $99 per month, you can access thousands of hours worth of high quality, world-class teaching. To check local pricing in your country, visit isow.org. For more great teachings like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Now, back to this teaching from International School of the Word. Now, that's interesting because that's what the priests did on earth at the tabernacle and both temples that were in Jerusalem. Now, in Revelation 8 and 3, let's look at heaven. What's going on in heaven? First of all, we know in Revelation 8 3, there is an angel over the golden altar in heaven. So the original golden altar that Moses patterned his after in the tabernacle is in heaven near the throne of God. In Revelation 8 verse 3, the angel takes incense, holy incense from the temple in heaven, and he offers it in on the golden altar with the prayers of the saints. So those prayers are in the golden bowls or the golden vials in heaven. And now the angel takes these prayers. Now this will be, of course, in the tribulation period when this happens and puts them all on the golden altar. Now this, Revelation 8, 4, this appears to be when prayers come up before God as the angels are taking these prayers and putting them on that altar and it comes up and now the words are, the, now God hears you the first day you pray. But as far as the answer coming, the answers come when they're taken out of the vials put on the golden altar and the smoke comes up before God. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? And that's how I picture this comparing the activity of the tabernacle and temple 
in the Old Testament time and New Testament time with what we read, especially in the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation. And here's a question. How long have you prayed? I mean, how long have you been praying for something? How long have you been interceding for something? Um, how long has it, has it been since you feel like there's been any kind of an answer? And, uh, and why are answers sometimes so difficult to receive? Are there hindrances to answers? And the Bible absolutely identifies that there are hindrances to answered prayer. So let's get through very quickly the four common hindrances to answered prayer. Number one, too much unforgiveness. And any unforgiveness will block your prayer and your answer. Look at Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive men for their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespass, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. So in other words, if you abide in any kind of unforgiveness, it will block the answer to your prayer and even block your own forgiveness. Now, if you've not got my book, Fishing in the Sea of Forgiveness, get that. It's, it's a very deep, detailed book that deals with so much of what we're talking about right there on unforgiveness. All right, number two, too much tossing to and fro, uh, meaning we pray and we go back and talk against our prayer. You know, you're saying, God saved my marriage while you're seeing a divorce lawyer. So it's taught you tossed to and fro. Ephesians 4 says this, that henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So when you pray, hold on to what you're praying for and keep confessing the prayer in a positive manner and never go against what you've prayed. Now this agrees with number three, which is there's too much wavering on our belief. Well, Lord, I thank you, you heard. Well, Lord, have you heard? Well, I don't know if you heard. Well, God, I believe you. Well, God, I don't. Well, I don't know what God's doing. It comes out of your mouth. You know what comes out of your mouth? Because it's in your heart. You've never convinced your heart that God has heard. You've never convinced your heart that God can do it. That's what the problem is. And James 1, 6 and 7 says this, but let a person ask in faith, nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he, and that's man or woman, think that he or she, I want to add that there, shall receive anything of the Lord. So in other words, wavering with your confession and wavering with your heart, it will hinder your prayer. Listen to what it says. You cannot receive anything from the Lord. And then I want to say this. Many times, and this is one we don't talk about, but I think this is, is very significant. Many times there is not, there's not much, uh, let me say it this way, there's too much of a lack of expectation uh, in your prayer being answered. In other words, I'm pray, I pray things and I expect God's going to help me. I can't wait till God helps me. But Rhoda in the book of Acts, if you'll look at her in Acts chapter 12, she was shocked when Peter was released when in reality they're praying for him to be released. She should have said, guess what? Peter's here. I don't think it's Peter. You know, they're shocked. Uh, Acts 3, verse 5, and he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something from them. What's that verse about? The lame man at the gate expected to receive something from Peter and John. And his legs are messed up. He can't walk. And I've often said he was begging for alms and got a new set of legs instead. <laughs> How you like that? So, but he expected to receive. So there has to be an expectancy in the scripture uh, for us to be able to believe that God is hearing our prayer and he's going to answer. So in other words, number four is this, never ever lose your expectancy because if you do, it could hinder the ability of not God to answer, but the length of time in which the answer comes. Now, one of the things I want to look at as far as prayer hindrances are demon powers that sometimes interfere with our prayer. And you've heard me mention several times, Daniel 10, where he's fasting and praying for 21 days and the prayer is being uh, hindered by a demon prince and he continues to hold on until an angel comes and binds the demon prince. And that angel, of course, was the warring angel, Michael, who wars against Satan. We can see that in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. And uh, then the answer is released through the angel Gabriel to the prophet Daniel. Thank you so much for supporting our ministry. If this has blessed you, please say a prayer for us. And if you would like to give, we have three ways that you can do that. You can give online at iso.org forward slash donate or text the word give and the amount 
to 423-225-9022. That's 423-225-9022. You can also give through the mail at ISOW 340 Paul Huff Parkway, Northwest, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37312. Thank you. God bless you, and may the Lord multiply your seed. Now back to this teaching from the International School of the Word. Now, I was studying his situation in Babylon, and I realized that every time under King Nebuchadnezzar, these men of God prayed, man, answers, bam, answer, fire, fiery furnace, answer, vision and a dream, answer, king had another dream, answer. And all of a sudden, here in chapter 10, we see this really hindrance in the atmosphere to prayer. And the Spirit of God gave me what I'm going to share with you. Man, I get so excited when I know I'm going to share a truth with you that's going to help you. First of all, I want you to remember this, that when the Medes and Persians came, the Jewish, the law was changed to where the Jews could go back from captivity to Jerusalem. So in Daniel 10, Daniel came into Babylon in chapter 1 as a 17-year-old kid, but by, his, by the time of the Medes and Persians, he is very old, late 70s or 80s in his age. The Jews, which are his prayer team, are going to leave and go back, and he's too old to make the trip. So Daniel stays in Babylon, watch this, while the prayer base begins to dwindle, and they, the Jews go back to Jerusalem. Number two. There is an increase in demonic activity because when the angel of God in Daniel 10 came to Daniel, he said, the prince of the kingdom of Persia has restrained me. Now, Babylon had been controlled by four big kings under the time of Daniel, but now the Medes and Persians, two empires, have taken over Babylon, which means the demon spirits over Media and Persia are now over Babylon where Daniel's living. So he now is experiencing, if I can say it this way, new levels and new devils. As the demonic power increases in a new area, his warfare is going to increase. Then there is an increase in deliberate idolatry, and they're passing laws against prayer with the Medes and the Persians, and all these other things are happening. So between the deliberate idolatry, the demonic activity, and the demise of the prayer base, and I say demise in the sense of, the better word is the decreasing of the prayer base, Daniel is going to be there as a man of God that doesn't have the undergirding support that he did have because there's transition taking place, political transition taking place, national transition taking place, spiritual transition taking place. And so um, the fact is this, that in the Old Testament, unrepentant priestly sin would hinder the activities at the temple. Isaiah 115, God would not receive the words of their prayers if it only became a ritual. And uh, another thing that we've got to understand, so let's make this practical today, is that we're losing a lot of our older people who have been prayer warriors for years. My dad, T.L. Lowry, I can name all the generals of the faith. These were praying, fasting men. They're leaving. They're going home to be with the Lord. And then we have a younger generation. Thank God for some young people coming up who still believe in fasting and prayer. But we have a younger generation coming up that does not have in our churches. When the older people die, people are too busy working two jobs to go to the prayer meetings and pray. And, and that's a problem we've got. So our battles are going to get more intensified if we don't get the intercessors in the local congregations that you and I need. And I have to say this to you in Luke 18, when you go to verse 8, and Jesus is giving the parable of this woman who is persistently going before the judge continually, and he's bearing long with her. And Jesus said, he answered her prayer, although it took time. In verse 18, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And <clears throat> it's important that you understand this. You cannot lose heart. You cannot lose confidence. And you cannot lose faith because of the crazy times that we're living in. Because ladies and gentlemen, they are definitely prophetic times. Let me say this. You can see ministers fall. Churches have problems. Churches get a bad reputation. People do things they shouldn't do. It's possible to lose respect for someone. It's possible to lose confidence in them. But don't you ever dare ever lose faith in God. Because God is not a man. God's not a man. He's a spirit. God is not a man. Where he dies, God is eternal and will never die. And God cannot lie. And that's what you got to base your confidence in. Amen. Amen. So uh, what we're going to do, I want to go to some other things here that we're going to look at. 
And so let's continue here for just a moment in another area that we need to study. For the next few moments, there are some very important rules for intercessors that have come from those who have years of experience. So I'd like to share some of these with you. Now pay careful attention, folks, because this is important. What does an intercessor do if they actually see in the spirit danger? Now, let me share this with you. Number one, be careful not to tell everyone, especially non-intercessors. Non-intercessors will go throughout the church and gossip about it, but they don't have the burden to pray about it. If you get something that you see is not right, maybe something's going on in the church and you sense it and feel it. This is not where you get three or four people and say, God showed me something, but I've got to tell you, you have to privately pray yourself. And the reason you don't go and tell other intercessors or you don't tell people, and I'm talking about personal private stuff about people, you don't tell other people is because even intercessors are at different levels of faith and they can talk about it more than pray about it. And I believe this, the more that you talk about it, then you create suspicion. And when you create suspicion, it's when the enemy and the devil can step in because there are people that will use their emotional feeling as a revelation from God. And I've watched that and it causes great, great, great danger. Be careful not speaking negative so that the enemy will not hear it and have a base to move in on what has been said. Number two, a danger is a warning and not necessarily a coming event. And intercessors, you need to understand this. Dangers can be revealed and it's not to scare you, but to prepare you for something. But at times you can pray against what is about to occur. Herod was killing the babies of Bethlehem and there was a warning given to get out. All right. But at the same time, when they were stoning Jesus, the spirit of God opened up a door for him to get out of an area supernaturally. So my, my point is, and the reason I'm saying this is I watched the situation of emerging a church where the intercessors got together and just basically gossiped about it and they stirred it up and it split the church right down the middle because of intercessors talking. And so please, if God shows you something about someone, don't be saying, I think God showed me, I think God, terrible. It's the worst thing you can do. Keep it to yourself and pray about it. And then if it's something serious and you see it emerging, then you go to the leadership of the church and talk about it. You do not go to lower people. You know, and I'm not saying lower in the for, for, form of authority, of lower authority and get things stirred up. Now, here's another thing. Intercession is to change an outcome and to avoid a possible self-invited crisis. That's why you're interceding to prevent it from happening. And the danger is, uh, you know, you will know that the danger is cleared and it's gone when your spirit has been released from it. That's how you'll know. So you continue to pray about it in private until there is an inner release. Now, when things are already happening that are known, that's where the group intercession comes in and begins to deal with the enemy at that point when it's known. But when it's not known and you feel it, be careful because what if you feel something and you didn't try the spirit to see it's of God and it's not from God, it's the enemy trying to put something in your head. See what I'm saying? It can cause serious trouble. Intercession is not dependent on emotions or thoughts before or after prayer. Remember when the father in Mark 9 came to Jesus saying, heal my son because he's an epileptic. The disciples prayed. The boy was not healed. Jesus came down and he said, Lord, if you can do anything, help me. See this poor fella, his emotions are torn up. He believes the boy is going to get healed. The boy does not get healed. He's coming to Christ, not knowing if he's going to get help. And so Jesus did touch that boy, but be careful having, if can I say this without anybody getting offended, mood swings between your intercession where you've got great faith and a failure that you have seen or something that didn't happen the way you expected it. And then you get all upset about it. This father had that happen to him. You keep holding on to God. Now intercessors can get weary because Elijah in 1 Kings 18 prayed the fire down on Mount Carmel, pray, Mount Carmel, prayed seven times for it to rain, outran the horses of Ahab, and that was all in a few hours of the same day. He, then he gets a death threat, goes 118 miles to Mount Horeb, sits under a tree and wants to die. The problem was he had wore himself out and he needed to be refreshed and his emotions had shifted from faith to fear 
because Jezebel said she was going to kill him. So he's, now he's totally afraid because she's been beheading prophets. So my point is, Elijah went to a place. God fed him. He refreshed himself. And then he came back with power. Intercessors, listen, if you're deep in intercession, the burden you carry can at times become so heavy that you will get very, very weary and tired. You have to go away. You have to refresh yourself. You have to let your emotions and your spirit get renewed in the presence of God. And sometimes you just got, and I'm not talking about leaving the church. That's not what I'm talking about. So don't get into all that idea. But sometimes you got to back away from people and things and spend time with you and God and sometimes with you and your family just to get out from that pressure that you're feeling for a, for a brief period of time. And that's what Elijah did. He separated himself, went up into a cave and God touched him. And then he came back with the fire telling Jezebel the dogs were going to eat her. <laughs> so that was, that was a different man after he, after he got refreshed. So the fifth thing about intercession is this. Do not judge an answer based upon the difficulty. I've said this in the Bible, in Matthew 8, 14. Jesus prayed for Peter's mother-in-law to have a fever. Oh, praise God. Anybody can pray for a fever. But then praying for a leper is harder. At least it's not hard to God to answer. So we should not look at things and say, well, she, they just found cancer. We need to pray that God will take it away. Well, she's got stage four. God bless her heart. Because never judge God's ability to do it based on the difficulty it appears in the natural to answer it. Don't do that. Judge it by the fact of God's word and what it says only. Intercessors, that's very important because nothing's too hard for God. Fifth thing is this, or the next thing is this. In intercession, it is God that makes it happen. You do nothing to make it happen. All you do is obey the prayer rules. You know, when the, when the wedding of Cana of Galilee was happening in John 2, 1 through 11, uh, you know, a wedding celebration back in that day lasted seven days and they ran out of the wine. And so Jesus, you know, is at the right place. Okay. Uh, he's at the right place the, or the people are there. The people are in the right place. They're in the presence of Christ. Uh, there is a direct petition. We have no wine. Here comes Mary. Watch Mary. Mary gets involved because he's go, he going to do what mama wants. And so she gets involved in the situation and they have a need. There is a lack. So she said, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there's the release. That's the thing that's going to release the miracle. So she lets him work. She doesn't drag around the pots. He gets people to bring him six water pots full of water. So in other words, my point is, and you can read this story in different ways, but my point is that she saw a need. She knew he could handle it and she left it with him. She just left it in his hands. They need wine. You got to do something about it. And then she said this in John 2, 5, whatever Jesus says unto you, do it. There is your miracle. There is how miracles happen. There's how things take place. Right there it is. Whatever Jesus says unto you, do it. Now, one of the areas that we want to get into, and we're going to save this for a, the final session. Uh, one of the areas is we're going to get into is interceding for finances, because this is an area that every church needs, every ministry needs, and individual believers themselves need. Because if you look at the world, especially when crisis comes, the biggest uh, fear that people have is the fear of not having the finances, the fear of not having the money to pay your bills, the fear of losing your car by getting repossessed, the fear of losing your house because you can't pay the mortgage, the fear of, of even not having your grocery money. Something can happen. And fear is an enemy of faith and fear is an enemy for an intercessor. And so it's very significant that you hear on how to intercede for finances. Now, the reason is that we have the Voice of Evangelism, the Omega Center International and ISO International School that the facilities are paid for. It costs me millions of dollars a year to run the ministry, but the facilities are paid for. Now the salaries are not paid for, the insurance is not paid for, the postage is not paid for, printing bills not paid for, magazines not paid for. That comes every month or every other month when we have to, to deal with getting the Word of God out. But we have had to learn how to pray in finances. When I was going to build the Omega Center International, and it was an $18 million building and all we had was $4 million and no bank would load me money. I knew it was the will of God. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it that I, like I know my name. And that's the foundation I started on. And so what I'm going to do in pastors and ministers and those that may be in small groups, especially, this might be one of the most important teachings that we're about to get into. And of course, we'll add some things at the end of it. And this will be our last session coming up for 
the, the course on prayer and for this uh, special uh, study with home uh, small groups on uh, the secrets of intercession. I hope you're making your notes. And I know I talk fast. I know what everybody in the small groups are saying. I wish he'd slow down. He's talking too fast for me to get the scriptures. Well, you have to hear faster and you have to write faster because if I don't do that, it stretches out to be way too long. So we're going to go to our final teaching here. And so stay with us as we talk about interceding for finances.